All right, we're going to be in Romans, starting Romans this morning with the message. And I hope this does not sound like I'm giving my pet peeves and my uh, things that aggravate me. Because it is. <laughs> because that's part of it. This is the message I had in my files. And this week is, of course, I pray about what I'm going to preach about and really plead with the Lord to show me something. I went through my, my Christmas files and I found this message that I'm preaching this morning. I'm calling it Christmas Substitutes. What people do instead of worshiping the Lord or remembering what he's done for us. Christmas Substitutes. What people do this time of the year instead of remembering Christmas and why the Lord was born into this world. Christmas Substitutes. Things that replace Jesus Christ at Christmas time. Replace him. They don't get rid of him, but by replacing him, they do get rid of him in a sense. Romans chapter 1, we'll begin reading in verse number 19. A somewhat familiar portion of scripture that I preach from fairly regularly, but I'm going to bring up another thought from these verses. And, well, let's just read, beginning verse 19, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them, it means everybody, everybody that exists. Everybody has a knowledge of God in verse 19. Therefore, because they have a knowledge of God, then let me ask you a question this morning. Are they or are they not then guilty? Are they guilty? Are they not guilty? They are guilty. Everyone, even if you've never heard about Jesus Christ, you are guilty. Guilty enough not to go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. That's what it says right here. Now verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Invisible things being seen. That's a strange thought, isn't it? Being understood. Not only are they seen, but they understand them by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So nobody can say, I didn't know. The Bible says everyone knows enough to condemn them. That's why everyone needs the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we need to send out missionaries, because they are all guilty throughout the world. Now, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. When you reject the Lord, there starts this regression downward, this slide, this slippery slope. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed. Now here's the word, changed. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made light to corruptible man. They changed. They changed Jesus Christ, according to verse 23, changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. They change God and the glory of God and the image of God into the image of man. They change Jesus Christ into the glory and the image of Santa Claus. They've changed God into Santa Claus. There are times when I, of course I would not do this. Just in my, my vain imagination, I, I think about this would be fun to do if I ever could and get away with it and not hurt anybody. Uh, get, buy a shotgun. I don't have a shotgun right now. I'd buy a shotgun. I'd get a lot of shells. I'd start driving around the streets of this city. Whenever I see some of these Santa Clauses on the roofs and these big Santa Clauses, let your imagination run wild. All right, back to verse 23. I, I, you need, folks need to sit down. Let me continue reading. And changed. They changed. They didn't eliminate. They changed. The glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore then, since they gave up on God, they turned away from God, verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up. If people turn from God, God turns from them. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. Go ahead, live that way. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Just yesterday, 
There was a vote in the Senate and Congress. It ended up the wrong way, folks. Now verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. They loved the creature more than the one who created us. Who is blessed forever. Amen. Father, I pray that you'll help me as I preach this morning. And Lord, it's just a shame what the world is doing to this time of the year. It's a terrible thing. And we confess it as part of this country that, Lord, we're trying to take a stand against it. And we speak out the truth. And so, Lord, I pray we'll be able to be honest about these things. And, and Lord, I just pray this morning, help me as I preach, direct my thoughts and my words. May they glorify the Lord when the world's trying to glorify so many other things. May we glorify the Lord here in our attendance at church, in our, in our minds, our hearts. May we glorify the Lord. Help me as I preach, please. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May we see it if you would. Then also read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. Things that replaced Jesus Christ at Christmas time. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. It's interesting what it says here, too. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Okay, they turn away from the truth. The Bible is the word, the truth. And shall be turned unto what? Fables. Made up stories. Myths of all around Christmas time. Santa Claus and the reindeer. And Rudolph with the red shiny nose. And Frosty the snowman. And, and all these things, they, they bring up all these, these myths, these, these fables, these stories that are not true, make-believe. They take the truth and they change it and they alter it and they're attracted to make-believe things, things that are not true. You know, when I go to a library or a bookstore somewhere, when I see a section on fiction, I think, I don't read fiction. Fiction are made-up stories. Fiction is things that aren't true. I don't want to read things that aren't true. I don't want to waste my time reading things that aren't true. I want to read nonfiction, which means real things, things where they really are. But here, they've made up stories, and they're uh, Santa Claus and Rudolph and Frosty the Snowman. Uh, that is fiction, myth. It's worse than that. It's fables. It's worse than that. It covers up what the real is. It's a substitute for the real, and the substitute is never up to the quality of the real. The real thing is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, let me bring up this morning with uh, seven different thoughts I'm going to bring up today. Uh, Christmas substitutes, things that replace Jesus Christ this time of the year. The first one is people who try to use this time of the year to draw people's attention to seeking World peace and unity. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 12, verse 51, he says, suppose ye them come to bring, give peace on earth. He said, I tell you nay. No, but rather division. Jesus Christ did not come to this world to bring peace to this world. Well, he said the angels called out peace and they sang about, you know, peace of God, great peace. Yeah, when Jesus Christ comes back, there will be peace. When Jesus Christ was here, those who are his have a peace in their heart. I have a peace in my heart through Jesus Christ because I'm born again. I don't worry about the eternity. I don't worry about what the politicians are going to do. I don't worry about where I'm going to go when I leave this world because I know I'm going to be in heaven someday when I, when I leave this world. I have that kind of peace. But... There is not going to be any such thing as world peace until Jesus Christ comes back and he makes them stop their wars. There will not be world peace until then. And so many people have that false hope and they are so disappointed. In fact, they're more than disappointed. And this is what's, this is what's scary. They're deluded. Now, please listen to me this morning. Anyone who thinks we're going to have peace in this world are deluded and they're going to try to affect peace by compromising with those who want war and those who want to conquer us, those who want to destroy us. 
Friends, the only way you can have peace today is by enforcing it. You can only have peace by enforcing it by having armies, by having police force. That's the only way you can do it today. If you let men have their own free will and you let natural men do whatever they want, they're going to want to serve themselves and they're going to hurt others to serve themselves. You cannot have peace today. Get that out of your mind, friend. There's not going to be peace until Jesus Christ comes back. But how many people today use this time of the year to bring peace? Even the Pope. And he's going to be on TV, I guarantee it, on Christmas, uh, on the news programs. He'll be there. And one of the things he'll probably talk about is we need to have world peace. He, among many millions of others, don't know what they're talking about. There will not be peace. And the Lord said that, and the Bible exemplifies that. There's not going to be peace until the Prince of Peace returns. So people that believe that, like the hippie lady at Office Max <laughs> that I met about a year, year and a half ago. I didn't know there any of them left. That's been a lot of years ago. But she wanted world peace. She says we ought to give up our arms and, and, and turn all our armaments in, get rid of all the nuclear warheads. You know, if America got, well, I don't want to get into this. This is a whole other thing. If America got rid of our nuclear warheads, uh, Korea, North Korea is not going to. And communist China is not going to. And communist Russia is not going to. Uh, they need to have some sense about this. They need to believe the Bible that men are sinners. Okay. But a lot of people will use this time to bring about and pray for, pray for even, world peace. They're so deluded, it's scary that they don't believe the Bible. That the Bible says mankind are sinners and they will destroy others. They will kill other people and not even worry about it. So one of the Christmas substitutes is praying for world peace. I'd like to have world peace. I wish there was. But I know the Bible. World peace, don't let that substitute the time for Christ. Number two, and here's, here's a strange one because it's very sneaky. The second one is to replace Christmas with family activities. It's a time for families to get together. Well, let me ask you, are families a good thing? Amen. Amen. Absolutely, they're a good thing. Should families be a priority in our lives? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, men, ladies, sometimes you need to work a job so you can have money to provide for your families. Amen. Uh, families need to get together. And there's uh, times when during the Christmas time when families get together. Is that a bad thing? No. Is that a good thing for families to get together? Yes, that's a good thing. But when it replaces Christ and replaces the reason for this season, it's not just family reunions. It's not just families getting together. But it should be emphasizing who Jesus Christ is and why he came. A time for the family to get together, that's a good thing. But remember that old saying, the good is the enemy of the best. Satan is sneaky. He's not going to tempt you many times to do wrong things. He's just going to tempt you to put good things in the place of the best things. You know, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Let me just show you this verse. Some of you probably are familiar with it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. It talks about prioritizing here. I remember the first time I was reading through the Bible as a very, very young Christian. And I was in Matthew reading this, and this really struck me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now, who's the me here? Jesus, Jesus Christ himself, the Lord. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, what is it saying here in verse 37? It says, you ought to love your father, your mother, but not more than Jesus Christ. It says here in verse 37, you ought to love your son and daughter, but not more than Jesus Christ. You ought to love Jesus Christ, number one, top priority. Number two should be your family. 
Yeah. Verse 37 says, you ought to love your father, your mother, your son, your daughter. Isn't that what it says here in verse 37? He that loveth father or mother more than me. It doesn't say you should not love them. It says you should love them, but you ought to love Jesus Christ more. Therefore, when there comes a time when you have to make a choice between your family or Jesus Christ and who you're going to obey and what you're going to do, then what should be your choice if Jesus Christ is number one? You ought to love him more. You ought to serve him more. And he needs to be number one. But you know what's interesting? There's very, very few times in your life, maybe never, when you have to make that kind of choice. You know what the decision is between uh, Jesus Christ and your family? You know what the answer to that question is? You can love both. You can uh, please both. You can go to family reunions. That's good. You can love your family. That's good. But if there ever should come a time, and there might be, when you have to make that kind of choice, you choose Jesus Christ. I know some missionaries that have given up on their family, left their families for a year, years. They left their wives back here in the States. They went to some foreign field to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, why? It was their family, their wife, their kids. Because God called them. Because God called them. That can't happen. Does it happen often? No, but it does. And the Lord says, whoever has forsaken their homes, their families, for me, they're going to receive a hundred times more, a thousand times more in eternity, if they're willing to do that. So if there ever does come a time, and by the way, okay, let me say something very convicting. Uh, you don't, don't, don't look guilty if you're guilty. You know, this coming weekend is the Christmas weekend, and you might have family coming in from out of town. Or you might have some family reunion or get together on maybe let's say Sunday, December 26th. Starting in the morning on Sunday. But we have church here on December 26th, Sunday morning. Where will you be? Sunday morning. December 26th. It shouldn't be a choice. You can do both. <laughs> do both. Bring family to church. I mean, what better thing can you do than that? So, but a lot of people, you know, it's turned into family time, not a uh, time to honor and remember the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, number three. Here's another Christmas substitute. Decorating their houses with lights, Christmas lights. Now, is that a wrong thing? No, no, I, I kind of like it. We drive around sometimes. There's certain parts in our town where they really, people have really gone, you know, whole hog, so to speak, in decorating their homes, and it's beautiful. I like it. I, I, Carol and I, sometimes we get in our car and we drive around. We find those places we know where they are. And so we'll go and look at the lights and go, wow, look at that. And wow, that's, that's great. Why not? Why not? But you know something that I think is true? Those people that live in the homes that have decorated lights, most of them are not Christians. Now, some are, of course, but most of them aren't. That's sad. That's how they celebrate Christmas. Not Jesus Christ decorating their houses with Christmas lights. I remember as a kid, I went to Neela Park. And we, as a young, young person, I mean, I was a little boy, probably seven, eight years old, something like that, I would guess. We lived in Cleveland, lived there in that area, but we went to Neela Park and we drove through and boy, that was tremendous, you know, the, the lighting uh, display they had there. I, I went to Neela Park a couple, just a couple years ago. What a disappointment. What a disappointment. As I looked at all the different lights, they had all kinds of things, but nothing about Jesus Christ. Nothing. Abs I mean, absolutely, positively nothing, even close. There were absolutely zero manger scenes, none. Uh, there were no angels, not Christian angels. They had some demonic little characters around. I don't know uh, what they were especially. Uh, they had some of the, a few of them around that they thought was cute. They were kind of cute the way they made them. And there were a lot of displays and different, they had maybe a, like a big star, but nothing like the Bethlehem star. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? What has happened to Neela Park over the years? What has happened when they used to have manger scenes and they had angels and they had uh, even scripture verses? 
They even have, remember they had a scripture verse, I forget which one it was, holiness unto God or Jesus Christ is born or Savior is born. They even had that in lights at Nila Park. That's not there anymore. There's no more scripture verses. There's no more major scenes. Why not? You know why not? Because it's not allowed. They are not allowed to have scripture verses. They're not allowed to have anything that's connected with Jesus Christ in Nila Park in their lights display. How far have we sunk? How far have we gone? Wow. Decorate houses with lights? That's good. If you do that, do it more. And if, if it gets really good, call me. I'd like to drive by your house and see it myself too. <laughs> but that, most of the people that do that are not Christians. That's as far as their spirituality goes, is putting some lights on their homes. That's what they substitute. Number four. They use Christmas as a time to drink. Beer, wine, liquor, alcohol, all of that. How has the, the alcohol companies and the alcohol people so turned America into such a drunken nation? They've connected celebrating anything with alcohol now. This is a drunken nation in which we live today. Uh, weddings, weddings, reception. You can't have a wedding reception unless there's alcohol there, they think. It's the end of the work week. Well, we've got to go to the corner bar. Celebrate the work week is over. Uh, if there's your sports team wins, you got to go out and celebrate and get drunk because your sports team has won. Uh, of course, New Year's is coming up. You know, you got to go out and get drunk because it's New Year's, isn't it? How have they sold America with such a bill of goods as they have? Uh, they've connected every kind of celebration with alcohol. It's unbelievable what they've done. It's unbelievable what they've accomplished in America today. You know, we have Christian weddings here at our church when we do it, not very often. But one of the requirements we have, and this helps the young couple, because sometimes their family wants to have alcohol at a wedding reception. At the reception, they want to have beer or alcohol or something. So we tell them, well, if they're going to have a wedding at our church, they can't have any alcohol at the reception. And people then say, well, what kind of a wedding is that if you can't have alcohol at the reception? Well, I'll tell you what kind of wedding it is. It's a Christian wedding. And Christians don't need to have alcohol at the reception. In fact, Christians, real Christians, don't want alcohol at their receptions. See? How have they done that? Well, they've done a good job, haven't they? They've done a good job of lining any kind of celebration with drinking. They've done well in doing bad. They've done good in doing bad. They've accomplished what they wanted to. It's a sad state of America today. A bunch of, a, a drunken nation, it really is. All right, number five, number five. Also, they sing about, here we go, Santa Claus. They sing about uh, Rudolph and the red nose, Rudolph the red nose reindeer. They sing about Frosty the snowman. Even Jingle Bells, that's not, that's a cute song. You can sing that sometime, it's not bad. But I'm just saying, where's the Lord in all these things? Turn to Proverbs chapter three, if you would. Proverbs chapter three, verse five. Where is the Lord in all these things? In fact, I was getting a little bit of an attitude. I confess my sin to you this morning. I was getting a little bit of an attitude uh, this holiday season, as they call it, holiday. And it's been brought up, and I started thinking about it. I started to agree with it. When people say happy holidays, they should say Merry Christmas. So I know sometimes you think about something and it starts to affect you. You get a little aggravated about it. Well, I was getting a little aggravated about that. I think in the happy holidays, I went to a giant eagle to do my shopping. And, and, and there was a Salvation Army person there. And they were ringing the bell. They had a the little pot there. And they were saying, happy holidays. No, it's Merry Christmas. Yeah, happy holidays is not raw. It's not bad. Again, here's the replacing something good with the best, you know. Uh, happy holidays, no. Merry Christmas. It's, it's Merry Christmas. In fact, I was getting this attitude I was telling you about. It's kind of coming out this morning, too, as I'm thinking about it here. Our church sign up front. I was thinking about this, and my wife, Carol, said, yeah, do that, do that. You see, she's got an attitude, too. <laughs> And the church sign up front, I was going to put it on the one side, it, let's see, it's Merry Christmas on the second line, not Happy Holidays. I can tell you have an attitude too. <laughs> 
But uh, it's, it is Merry Christmas, uh, not just Happy Holidays. You know, here, I got an answer. When somebody says Happy Holidays, your answer to them should be, what holiday? You say Happy Holidays, well, what holiday are you talking about? And they'll start to think, well, maybe they'll think New Year's. But maybe they'll think Christmas. That's a good answer, isn't it? What holidays are you talking about? Happy holiday, happy holiday. What holiday are you talking about? Yeah, okay. That's my attitude again. Let's go on here. Okay, so they sing about Santa, uh, the Rudolph, uh, uh, Frosty the Snowman. They sing Silver Bells. They sing I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, all these things. They have pictures of family uh, huddled closely around maybe a fireplace in a home. Uh, they're all cozy and calm and peaceful and loving the family. You know, they have those kind of pictures. You've seen them. And then what do they do? What do they read there uh, as the family's gathered together? Do they read the Bible? No. Do they read about the, uh, the count of the, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. What do they read there as they're all huddled together for the most part? The night before Christmas. And all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. What is that poem all about? Santa Claus. But they picture it. They've got the husband and the wife and the kids, and they're all, uh, usually maybe in their pajamas or bath, or, you know, they're kind of uh, all cut. And that's, that's nice to have a family together like that. I think we ought to do that more often. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing, but what in the world are they reading? Santa Claus? What happened to Jesus Christ? Where is he in all these things? Uh, sometimes families or people will try to please both. They'll sing some of the Christmas carols, you know. They'll also sing both. You know what happens there? You don't make anybody happy in the family then. The ones that are not Christians, they don't want to sing the Christmas carols, so they're griped about having to sing the Christmas carols. And those who are Christians in the family, uh, they're forced to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which like a five-year-old can sing. You know, that's really when you should stop singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. When you're five years old, by the time you're five and a half, you're too old to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I think that deserves an amen. 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 All right. But they're going to they're gonna be forced to sing Christmas carols, and the Christians are going to be forced to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and they're going to leave that family reunion, family get-together, uh, equally unhappy. Nobody's going to be happy, because they were made to sing something they didn't want to sing. <laughs> yeah, that's fun this morning. Aren't you glad you came to church? Amen. Amen. Yeah, they sing about Santa. Santa, put the end at the end of the word. You get an idea who that is a type of. Oh, I never read Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Let's get there. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine understanding. Now, verse 6. In all thy ways, that includes Christmas time, the end of the year, all thy ways, acknowledge him. The acknowledge means the opposite of ignore. Acknowledge means a recognition of his presence. That's P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. That means he is here. He is, he is here. He's there. He's everywhere. God is. I'll talk about that tonight. But that's the word acknowledge. In all thy ways, everything that you do, all thy ways, acknowledge him. I realize he's involved in that. I recognize his presence in everything we do. And he shall direct thy paths. He'll help you if you recognize his presence and not ignore him in every part of your life, all thy ways. Boy, that's good preaching, isn't it? I mean, you, you remember that when you go home today and you start to apply that in your life if you aren't already or apply it more. It's going to make a difference in your life. It's going to make a difference. Number six, go to church. A lot of people uh, in, in place of Jesus Christ, they go to church. He's saying, are there, I mean, people go to church and don't think about Jesus Christ or don't go to church as a replacement, as a substitute for Christ himself. Churches are filled with people like that. They think going to church is going to get them to heaven. They think because they're faithful to a church that they're going to go to heaven. Now, friends, don't use church as a substitute for Jesus Christ. Coming to our church is not, will not get you to heaven. You need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They're going to have pictures of uh, churches on the news on December 25th. They'll have Catholic churches and they'll have Pentecostal churches. and Maybe they'll even have a Baptist church. I've never seen one, but maybe they'll start this year doing that. Uh, but they'll have people going to church all the time because people go to church uh, on this week that recognizes the Lord Jesus Christ. But it always worries me when the news media promotes something spiritual. They never get it right. Leon Bibb, okay, Leon Bibb, remember him, Andre Bernier, Andre Bernier, thank you. Leon Bibb, remember those two names, Leon Bibb, Andre Bernier, because I tend to forget their names. But there was one time, it was a few years ago, and Andre Bernier claims to be a Christian, I, I think he is. Uh, I've met him personally, I've well, not talked to him personally a little bit, but uh, there was one time on the news program, and it was a Saturday night, and Andre Bernier was given the weather report, and Leon Bibb was the one that was the main, like, the, the uh, news, newscaster that night. And so uh, Leon Bibb was talking to Andre Bernier. Andre Bernier then g gave the weather report. And then Andre Bernier asked Leon Bibb this question that really threw Leon Bibb. He almost, like, gagged on it. Andre Bernier asked Leon Bibb, Well, are you going to church tomorrow morning? Friends, it was wonderful. I mean, it was just great. I sat there and I looked at Leon Bibb and the camera went back on him, you know, right when he asked him the question. Andre Bernier, camera right back to Leon Bibb. And he just sat there and you could tell his mind was going and nothing was coming out. He didn't know what to say. He was on the spot. If he said no, he'd look bad to some people. If he said yes, other people would criticize him for that. He was on the spot. And I noticed after that, Andre Bernier was not on that news program anymore. I thought, wow, what a simple question. And the turmoil of that little question, are you going to go to church tomorrow? It was Saturday night, news program. Are you going to go to church tomorrow morning? All right, so that's uh, going to church. Going to church. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. How many times have you heard that? All right, number seven, I'm done today. Uh, oh, yeah, giving gifts to everyone except Christ. <laughs> you know, Christmas time we share. We have family reunions, family get-togethers. Uh, sometimes you might share gifts or back and forth. Maybe you'll pick a number, you do that routine, and, and then the number you get, that's a certain person, you have to buy them a gift. Or maybe you just put a gift and wrap it and put it in the center, everybody then picks and chooses. You know, you know, there's different ways you can do that. And I personally enjoy that. I always like that, exchanging the gifts. I do. But I think, where is Jesus Christ in all this? Nothing, nothing. Let me ask you this question as I'm about done here. How would you feel if on your birthday you were totally ignored by all your family and your friends? How would you feel if on your birthday your family and your friends gave gifts to each other, but nobody gave you anything? on your, your birthday. That's what people do to the Lord. Two last questions. Number one, why are there substitutes? We talked about why are there? Because people don't want to think about the Lord. They want to do something. You've got to fill that time so they can keep their mind off the Lord. And then who do you think is behind this wanting to replace the Lord? Who is it? that wants to be like God. There's one main character, but I think that's shared by everybody to a degree too. Let's honor the Lord this year by remembering him. Father, please bless now as we thought about these things. Lord, some of them are just things that bother me because people get all excited about this time of the year, but you're just left out in the cold. Like in the book of Revelation there, where you're knocking on the door outside, knocking on the door, desirous to enter, but the door has to be opened from the inside. And Father, I pray, I pray that this morning there'll be some people that make the right choice here, that put you first and recognize this time of the year to honor the Lord. Bless the invitation time so we can make some decisions ourselves. 
so we can pray for ourselves, pray for others. Especially many here this morning will probably be seeing family members. Maybe they'll need to pray about and desire to pray for their family, that maybe they'll have a chance to witness to them. So please bless now. Bless this invitation time. Maybe someone even this morning really wants to turn to that one that can give them eternal life and joy and peace and assurance and confidence. That's what the Lord can do when he forgives our sins. And we turn to him as your word says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you for that wonderful promise. Please bless the invitation time. For whatever spiritual needs are here and desire, spiritual desires are here. In Jesus' name I pray.